Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Body Chopping Michael Kester. Yeah, I pretty much just chop bodies for a living. And uh, we got two movies on Double Feature, which is the show that you are listening to right now. American Psycho and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. So uh, you stealth this in here. We were, we were talking, we are drafting up the schedule, yeah. and you go, hey, we should really do Henry Portrait of a Serial yeah. Killer. My yeah. assumption then was what you meant, and, and I guess... You know, this is my fault for assuming. I believe that what you meant was, I have seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, and therefore, I think it's a good movie for us to do on the show. No, that's not what I meant. What actually, you actually meant. Go on. What I, what I meant was, I haven't seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, but I probably should. Let's put it next to something else that's a portrait of a serial killer. This accidental double feature idea that you have created. Not accidental. <laughs> turn, uh, underhanded, maybe? Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, that's better. That feels, um, objectively, that feels more true and more fair on all fronts. Mm -hmm. um, this underhanded double feature you've created was a brilliant idea. Oh, good. Which is why I agreed to it. Good. Can I take credit for that? Yeah, I'm going to do absolutely. very few brilliant things on uh -huh. our show today. Okay. I'm going to take credit for this one. Great. So uh, today we have some serial killer character studies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We also have a little bit of transgressive fiction. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit of, um, you know, our characters feel confined by the status quo. Here that's a bit extreme because they're murdering people. But uh, I, I don't know that we've ever really covered the term transgressive fiction before. No, it's, probably not. It's something that seems to come up anytime we talk about taboo movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's generic enough that it may come up in every single movie we yeah. do. But that's really, that's one of the things when you talk about American Psycho, people think about a lot. The idea of uh, breaking out of the status quo and kind of, um, you know, society having these expectations, our character feeling... Uh, almost claustrophobic, confined by them, like he has to break out of some kind of prison, uh -huh. challenge those things. And we're going to see a bit of that in both of the movies. So we're going to spoil these films. Boil them to death. Thanks for that. Yeah, that was actually, no pun was intended there, but... Uh, I challenge you to create a pun for the chapters. Okay. Right now. Um, yeah, Well, uh, right. we'll turn that page when we get to it. I never stop being impressed with you, ever. I just <laughs> never stop. So you can use the chapters feature, you can skip between the two movies... Skip over American Psycho. Skip uh, to Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Which is the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. That's my biggest surprise. When you, when you set up this double feature, my only concern is that it would be redundant, mm -hmm. which is probably my concern with all of our double features. Yeah. Or our show or our in show. general, yeah. compared against mm -hmm. the rest of the internet. But brilliantly, there is enough difference oh, there's between these two. Far and away enough difference. I can think of one major difference, but it's already venturing into spoiler territory. That major difference is American Psycho, which is the first movie that we're doing. Let's get this shit out of the way right now. Mary Heron, uh -huh. who has a vagina. She does have a vagina. But At also least directed I'm led this to film. believe she has a vagina. Sure, certainly. Um, we've glossed over female directors so many oh, times. I thought you were going to say we've glossed show. over vaginas. Oh, that's probably happened too. That's yeah. never happened. Every mentionable vagina on the history of Double Feature. We, we you have, would say we get in depth. I was going to say we've exploited to its full potential. I almost stopped myself from saying that for the reason that you elected to. Thanks. This, uh, I think this says a little bit about ourselves. If we're going to look at this idea of feminism. Mm-hmm. The fact we're not even aware that these movies are directed by women. Yeah. We're certainly not putting them on the show because right. they're directed by women. We've had a couple in the past. Yeah, we have. And we didn't really take a lot of time to talk about their directors. And so I feel like this might be a good excuse sure. just this one time to indulge and uh, talk about Mary Heron. All right. Who was 47 when she made this movie. Wow, that's so that's that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's, isn't that's that strange? old for a director. You know, you think well, that. Well, I mean, I don't know. Did she do anything? What did she do before this? She did, um, well, she before this, she did I Shot Andy Warhol in okay. at mid-90s. Okay. 
And then this was, what, 2000? Somewhere yeah, around there. Yeah, something like that. And the notorious Betty Page, that Betty Page documentary. She did that? Was Yeah, that was oh. uh, 2005. Mm-hmm. She's done a lot of TV stuff, though. Okay. I mean, she did, uh, she did Oz, she did Six Feet Under, she did The L Word, um, Big Love. She was kind of on the HBO payroll for a while. Right on. And so she's had her hand in uh, at least a single episode of a lot of those different series. The movie was also co-written by the actor who plays Elizabeth in right. the film. So, you know, we're looking at a movie that is written by her and Mary Heron, and then directed by Mary Heron. Really uh, female-fronted film here. Now, we saw her a little bit on the show when we did uh, This Film Is Not Yet Rated. Okay. Uh, she talked a little bit about, you remember she was talking about censorship and about some of the stuff in American Psycho. That was year one, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember been... almost nothing from year one. The really the standouts for year one for me is you not being sure whether to be ashamed or to masturbate during Hostel Two. I don't know why I didn't just do both. Masturbate with shame. That's the new tagline for double feature. If we're going to talk about transgressive fiction today, uh-huh. Michael Kester, okay, we need to talk about shameful masturbation. All right. My point was that double feature is a shame-free masturbatory zone. Yeah, that's true. Anyways, what I was getting, masturbate with pride. <laughs> what I was getting back to is that people remember Christian Bale from American Psycho. They do. They don't remember Mary Heron, which is fair because she's behind the camera, so sure. that's okay. But they remember Christian Bale. And we've gone out of our way in a lot of the movies that feature Christian Bale and Double Feature not to really talk about him. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's not to say anything about Christian Bale, but it's sort of, uh, there's a bit of an oversaturation sort of thing. Yeah, well, I think a lot of it comes from uh, what The Dark Knight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the, the same thing when we talk about uh, Johnny Depp and that director whose name I feel like if I even say... It's Tim Burton, right? Uh huh. Well, I I would also I would also go so far as to say that Johnny Depp's super saturation came from Jack Sparrow. That is also true. Yeah, you get into these uh, Hollywood sort of Jerry Bruckheimer, maybe a, a name I've never mentioned on yeah. the whole feature before, Jerry Bruckheimer films. I I don't know why I just don't feel like we need to like what could we possibly add to sure. that conversation? Right. Well, that that's film discussion from USA Today. Yeah, That's exactly. not our territory. Yeah, exactly. We cover we cover fucking Herschel Gordon Lewis, not <laughs> sure. Jerry Bruckheimer. But Christian Bale is something that really stands out about this movie. It's true, absolutely. I remember watching some of the behind the scenes kind of stuff when this first came out on DVD. Yeah, and hearing his accent. Yeah, and then realizing that in my head at the time, Christian Bale. I mean, part of it is that the movie's called American Psycho, right? But if I thought of cinematic american fucking icon you know sure. american psycho that's that's sure. what i went to for that just this guy who stands out as uh satirical just in the how, satirical american poster child you know he's so over the top mm-hmm. uh, the character is so yeah. over the top that's what the entire fucking movie's about and then to to hear his accent right <laughs> it's, it, it was i mean i had no idea we were looking a bit at the uh, the Miles Fisher video yeah, before we watch yeah. this. There are so many icons to. If you haven't seen this Miles Fisher video, by the way, um, I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's it's not really. There's mm-hmm. no industrial beats. So what do yeah, I know about right. it? But uh, this guy who looks vaguely like Christian Bale, he looks or more a, than vaguely, <laughs> or a lot, or identical to Christian Bale. I would perhaps, go as close to identical. Has uh, reenacted some of the iconic moments mm-hmm. from this film yeah. for his music video. Right. Um, so you can Google that. But uh, the icons of this film are so clear, yeah. even after all this time, sure. that a music video that comes out 10 years later, it has, I mean, people see it and they know, there's no, you know, American, this is American Psycho title mm-hmm. card. It's you just, just know sure. looking at it. But if you're going to go with title cards, I think that uh, there, are, there are two things. For me, business cards and videotapes. Yeah, right? Well, I mean, that gets to this question of how does the movie get under your skin? Yeah. And that's something I really want to talk about in both of these films today. But uh, how the horror is portrayed. If we're going to look at this as a horror film, Mm -hmm. you know... Which a lot of people, I would say, mistakenly do. Sure, certainly. I I talked on year one a lot about how I'd never really seen or was interested in horror before this uh, this show. And this was one of the few mildly, you know considered horror films sure that i owned because i looked at it more as a piece of satire sure which is i think probably the 
I don't want to say something like the correct way no, to look the at strength. the movie. Thank you. This is a great satire film. It is. It's an amazing piece of satire. I think uh, if I had to narrow down, I mean, uh, give me your take on this. What is, what's really horrifying about this movie? The thing that's really terrifying about it is the fact that this guy is supposed to be, you know, your standard, completely successful guy. I mean, we live in Chicago, right? This is the guy that gets on the L sure. at 9 a.m. Sure. Yeah. The guy that goes down to the loop, goes into a high-rise building in a suit, walks in, says hi to the receptionist, spends the entire day in his office, is a member of high-functioning society, mm-hmm. and in his off time, he's mean to homeless people. <laughs> yeah. He kills his competition. He's a total fucking whack job. Right. And he knows that he's a total whack job, but he's more concerned with self-image than self-preservation. I think that's what really gets to me. You know, if something gets under my skin about this movie, it's less of the gore and more of the lifestyle. Right. The things that he's obsessed about. So we're talking about Patrick Bateman. Yeah. Who, by the way, is 27. Mm -hmm. The older I get, the weirder that is to me. Yeah. Do you find that strange? I find that, I find that about strange with anything. When I, when was the last time you watched Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? (laughs) We're older than all those kids now. Yeah. Isn't that weird? I remember um, Frank Miller once talking about, you know, when he became the age that Batman was. Yeah. And what a weird awakening that was for him. And I finally got that moment when I heard that uh, Patrick Bateman was 27. Mm-hmm. I said, wait a second. Uh, I can never be as old as Patrick Bateman. Right. That's a weird thing for me. So if this is a satire of anything, it's a satire of Wall Street in the late 80s. Sure. Um, Unlike Wall Street, which came out in the late 80s. Don't even get me started on Oliver Stone. If you're going to ask me what's a more accurate portrayal of Wall Street, the crappy film Wall Street or American Psycho, I'm going to let American Psycho win, even if I set up the wrong question for that answer. All right. Money never sleeps. God, fuck that cynical piece of shit. Oh, I hate that movie. This movie says nothing about capitalism. It says everything about lifestyle. Sure. That's where you want to go in a film about well, Wall Street. It's a lot about personal image and about... Absolutely. I, I, think, I think a really good... a really, If we want to talk about satirizing Wall Street, mm-hmm. take the moment where he has the two hookers in his living room. Sure. And asks, you know, do you want to know what I do for a living? Well, not really. And then he tells them and they have no idea. Yeah. That's how that would actually go. And it would totally drive that man insane right knowing that he was about to be inside not one but two people who had zero interest in how successful he had been yeah i mean i think you found the moment of the film Mm -hmm. you know i didn't even think about that going back to all of these uh, these different things that happen and what that says about his uh his character but that scene is something we see reoccurring constantly sure he's obsessed with these things the film shows us how obsessed he is. Right. The film shows us nobody else gives a shit. Mm-hmm. Nobody gives a shit. And he almost seems oblivious to that. Yeah. He seems mildly annoyed, but like he needs to shrug it off yeah. in order to continue yeah. breathing as a human being. Right. You know, and that's part of the humor of the film. I mean, he, uh, American Psycho is a lot more humorous than I always remember it being. You know, when you use a word like satire, I suppose that's that's supposed to be true. But Brazil's also satire. Brazil is satire. I suppose some people would consider Brazil laugh out loud funny. But I it's, would also uh, consider it that. Well, what I'm trying to get at, and maybe Brazil's a bad go-to, but I don't think satire necessitates laugh out loud funny, right? No, I, I agree fully. Um, something like South Park would be yep. something that I think I could watch, not laugh once, and still go, this is brilliant. But then again, a lot of people think South Park is the funniest fucking thing on the planet. And they're probably right, and I'm probably wrong. I, you know, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, this show has brought me to this, to this point where I don't really know if there is a right and wrong. <laughs> sure. I kind of think everybody's wrong, and that only directors are right, which is one of my driving reasons to get a film made. So that I can actually be right about a film for a change. I feel the exact same way as you do, except the opposite. But I feel like somehow we completely agree because of it. Patrick Bateman is on the verge of tears when he can't get a table. There's a moment of sheer panic when he realizes Paul's apartment overlooks the park. Of course, there's a moment of sheer panic, we think, for security because he's a killer. Uh-huh. and Our mind is instantly made the movie about right. that. But it's because the view, the apartment, is, is more expensive is than better his. than his. Yeah. Right. It's a status. It's to all status. To hear the things that he 
thinks about. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you do something narrative, when you do something like Dexter, which mm-hmm. I think is inspired a lot by American sure. Psycho, and you try and get inside a serial killer's head, you have uh, a movie or a TV show or a, a book written from the serial killer's perspective, you can't really talk about, hey, I'm worried about where I'm going to stash this body or what if I get caught. I yeah. mean, you have to deal with how psychopathic these sure. people are. Sure, How they have no feeling for right. the people they kill. Right. How their concerns are completely somewhere else. You know, the, the people in this movie, and not just Patrick Bateman, and we'll get to that, and, you know, we've been talking about him as a killer a lot, and mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are already yelling at their, their podcasts, and we'll mm-hmm. get around to the end in a second. Screaming at their Zunes. But, you know, all of the people in this movie, they read... As if it's just trying to show off. Sure. You know, they quote all of these. You as a musician probably run into these fucking douchebags oh all the time. Oh my God, at who, nauseum. Who read these elitist, you know, journalistic reviews. Sure. Not to say anything bad about the magazines. I'm not going to like no. go off on the New York Times or anything. Sure. But to read the reviews in there, we know a little something about oh, reviews. At absolutely. The very least, if nothing about journalism or papers. No, I, I mean, I run into that all the time and... And just people, I mean, I feel, I think there's a really odd connection to the music world. I mean, the art scene, you're, you're familiar with the art scene. It's not just ah, a music scene. thing, but there are just people who are involved in the art scene, not because of their love of the art, but because of their capability of imbuing status. Sure. You, you start a band, not necessarily because... You're a good musician because you love making music, because you want to share something with people. Sure. But because you know that you have a look and connections and that you will be interviewed on fucking... Q101. Yeah. Q101. Don't hate me. I don't hate you. Find Michael's Q101 interview. Is that online somewhere? It's on YouTube. And all I get on YouTube is meltdowns. So they're quoting these reviews out of major papers to show off how they read and you know, you talk about that. I mean, it's similar to their love of music. Yeah. Uh, Patrick yeah. Bateman, you know, the infamous scene where he's talking about that album. Huey he Lewis in the news. Yeah. He does not actually uh, love music. You know, right. he's in his apartment talking about fucking Genesis. Yeah. He loves to show off his love of music. Yeah. And no one cares. No one ever cares. Mm-hmm. That kind of self image is really important to him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he talks about himself as if he's uh, better than all these people and if, as if that's factual, right? When he's talking about his haircut, it's just factually better than, you know, than someone else's haircut. But he sees uh, these certain moments where he recognizes his own weakness when standing up next to somebody else, and that devastates him. Uh, he sees a better business card, yeah, and he is completely decimated. He's you visually see him crumble in the mm-hmm. scene. I mean, that's one of those things where we have to go back to crediting Christian Bale. They're all talking about these cards, and when he finally sees the final card, I mean the the look on his yep. face, it's like he's destroyed. So this is all part of the satire, and then uh, I guess uh, as a product, something that I find very humorous. But from the opening credits. I mean, you want to talk about uh, something that's Dexter-esque. Yeah. You know, the opening credits of this movie giving you the impression of blood and then moving to something else. Giving you the impression of blood and then moving to high society. Right. I mean, it's a perfect setup for what's going to happen in this film. Uh, But the funny line that I always go back to in my head, there's two. One is, feed me a stray cat, which we'll get to in a second. Mm -hmm. The other is, I have to return some videotapes. Yes. I'm not sure why this is the funniest fucking thing I've ever heard, Mm -hmm. but it's an excuse I use in my personal life all the time. I think what's funny about it is, you know, in American Psycho, it makes sense to return some videotapes. Sure. And the way he uses that is humorous, but in the 80s, you return videotapes. Yep. No one returns. First of all, you can't even rent a video, much less a videotape these days. It's true. uh, With blockbusters shutting down Mm -hmm. left and right. In fact, the mere mention of them on our show is probably the most fame and notoriety they've gained in uh, sure. months, if not years. Uh-huh. But then going to Feed Me a Stray Cat. I mean, what I love is this whole time we're talking about how ridiculously crazy he uh, he is. Mm-hmm. You know, Wall Street has burned him out. He's killing people left and right. The ending would leave us believe well, essentially that he's not killed anyone. Sure. Which is almost more insane right. than the former part of the film. Yeah, we and, thought he was a nut job. Now he's that much worse. And the thing that I really like about this film with the unfolding of the fact that he's not killing anybody is if we take the 
the detective, right? Uh, Willem Dafoe's character, but sure. straight, I yeah. would be led to believe. He goes through this film, and the whole time, I'm sitting, watching, going, you cannot be a fucking detective. Look how guilty this guy yeah, is. Yeah, right. And then it turns out he's not guilty, and you realize, oh, he was actually a really a good detective. detective. Yeah being able to see through the fact that this was just a flustered Wall Street motherfucker. Yeah, and in retrospect, making that one of the smarter characters yeah. of the film, which is a, a really amazing kind of reveal, something sure. you may not even pick up on when you finally get that information at the end. And he's also po probably the most human character in the film. Certainly, he, certainly. he picks up the Huey Lewis album, but because he likes it. And you know, now that you edge that, he detects that Patrick Bateman does not give a shit about right. music. Oh, uh, it's perfect. I love the way they reveal this. Mm -hmm. When we talked about Fight Club, we talked a lot about uh, potential ways to reveal things and sometimes coming off as heavy-handed. Uh, we talked about that uh, again in uh, in the movie Psycho and Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. This is just the most dry, perfect way oh, to... Yeah. I mean, a car explodes, and it's one of those things where a lot of people watching this movie who go, I'm better than this movie. I know that cars don't really explode when you shoot them, only to find out that's really kind of part of the plot. Right. Uh, Bateman uh, looks at his gun eventually and, and thinks, oh, wait, cars don't explode when you shoot right. them. It's as if even he isn't believing the illusion. It's starting to get ahead of him at this point. Well, it, it's basically that he's just a really big Mythbusters fan. Mythbusters didn't even exist back when this movie came out. This guy's nuts, dude. Nor did it exist in the 80s. Totally nuts. You can tell we've just started year four because it's once again your goal to tag Mythbusters in every single episode. We Absolutely do. fucking true. So the character's iconic. It's what makes the movie interesting. Mm -hmm. The scenes are certainly iconic. Mm -hmm. uh, the the satire that it talks about. Can I have an aside here, really quick? Yeah, for briefly. Sure. Anybody who is listening to this show and saw American Psycho the last time, two, three, five years ago, ten years ago, rewatch American Psycho. Yeah, watch it with a fresh mind. Watch it because no, Christian Bale's real best film isn't The Dark Knight. But you really need to watch the film again. And if you've seen it recently, or perhaps you watched it for the show. I'm going to give you uh, two small amazing things that you can now check out. Um, one is Rules of Attraction, oddly, uh -huh. written by the same author. Has some of the, uh, as a lot of those books do, the overlapping characters. Sure. So Rules of Attraction, in part, stars uh, the character Sean Bateman, who is, I believe, Patrick Bateman's younger brother. And I think there's a, a couple of references to them. It's just a strange, odd tie, and it reminds me of that. Um, some of All Fears for red october i was gonna whole, say um, tom jackie, clancy thing i was gonna say jackie brown michael keaton and that soderbergh movie too out of sight was that was the, I, I no longer have any idea what i'm talking about second thing and i just briefly there's a photo shoot in empire magazine i it's a 20th anniversary or something sure. i don't have all the details in front google, of me google american psycho empire magazine you'll know exactly oh it's amazing and so these are these photos were so distracting. I we yep. couldn't even really spend a lot of time looking at them this morning. But they are uh, photos from they're actors from these very iconic movies. Mm -hmm. Sort of, I don't even want to say portraying iconic scenes. Right, they're thematic photo shoots. Yeah, you look at the, the one uh, with Patrick Bateman is Christian Bale. Um, you know, recently yeah. reprising sure. this role. Not for the, he's not dressed like Patrick. He's dressed like Patrick Bateman, but he has the Christian Bale close haircut, sure, harsh times yeah, kind of look. It, that's exactly what it is. You know, as you're looking at these photos, they seem to be the actors uh, in the settings of the characters. Mm -hmm. Might be the best yeah. way to describe yeah, them. Sure, um, the actors are dressed, uh, I guess, slightly different from the roles. Uh, the one of Christian Bale, he simply has an axe, and he's standing in front of a table of business cards. There's a great one of Arnold Schwarzenegger in a suit, standing in front of a motorcycle. With some sunglasses yeah, on. Yeah, there's a Shaun of the Dead one. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of yeah. really good... There's a uh, Silence of the Lambs one. Yep. So just fantastic photos. So look those up. I think that was uh, Empire Magazine. So the second film that we covered is Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. And like I said in the beginning, if you chaptered over it, totally you're right. We're all about freedom of uh, chaptering right. here on Double Feature. But I had never seen it before. All I knew really was that it was Michael Rooker, who uh, he plays Henry. Right. Um, and Michael Rooker recently boomeranged back to me. I've always been a Michael Rooker fan, but mm -hmm. I've never been able to really 
kind of own him the yeah. way I did when Call of the Dead came out, which is it's a video game. Going to make it brief. You play as Michael Rooker, Robert England, Sarah Michelle Gellar, or Danny Trejo, and you shoot at George Romero. That's the game. Yeah, I kind of amazing. Danny Trejo has a machete. I mean, I don't need to explain yeah. what you just said. Yep. I think you, I think you've set it up beautifully. It's, uh, it's one of those things where I was flipping through the Xbox Marketplace yeah. thingy, and you know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, was that Robert England's face in that zombie game? What the fuck? That guy looks a lot like Robert England. Yep. And you uh, click on it or push the A button or flail your arms at your connect or however yep. the fuck you get into that. And uh, yeah, amazing. Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer is one of those Man With No Shoes movies that uh -huh. people request sure. we do all the right. goddamn time. So maybe when you said, uh, you know, let's do this movie, that's what lit up in the back of my uh -huh. head. Cred. You just have a fluorescent Las Vegas style cred lamp in the well, back you know of what your it brain. Is. So we use a Gmail address we do. for our, uh, yeah, where you send the naked photos. Uh huh. Double and I have, show at gmail.com. And I love Gmail. I think it's probably the best thing Google has created outside of Google Voice, which lets me use an iPod instead of paying a monthly phone bill. Anyways, it has these filters set up, just like, you know, any email client would, but yeah. they're, they're right on the website. You don't need to know anything about the mail app on your uh -huh. Mac or any of that shit. Mm -hmm. You just go on the website, you set up filters. So I can go on there and set up a filter for, I don't know, Blade Runner. And then it automatically marks all of those messages as read and moves them out of the inbox before I even see them. Mm. It's really, really fascinating. Also fascinating. This movie is shot in our beloved Chicago. Oh, I really like Chicago. I'm a big fan. You know, it's great to see these tiny, tiny, the Chicago Tribune. Sure. Or, you know, the big one for me was the 22, the Clark bus. Yeah. And over by the, over by Best Buy. Yeah. And it's pointed at, uh, you, Mr. Diner aficionado will know what the, what's the name of that goddamn, uh, I've never the, even it's been one, there. It's one of the few remaining golden nuggets that hasn't been changed into a golden angel or a golden apple if you find these, if you come to Chicago, I demand you find one of the Golden Diners and the 22 bus and Henry. I want to let everyone who listens to this show know we, uh, we were one term away from you filling the entire show talking about Golden Apple. Oh, my so God. So had this been Golden Apple instead of, what is it, Golden Nugget? Golden Nugget. We would have been in serious trouble That's here. true. Golden Apple is the, I guess, the post-show Glitter yeah. Mouse well, hangout. It's just, it's just, it's the haunt. Yeah, it is. I can see I've, I've, I'm holding you back right now. Back to Henry. Uh, back to Tom Tolls. So yeah, let's here, go back this, to Tom This Tulls. is what I'll do. I'll derail you onto Tom Tolls, who it's, I know you want to talk about. Who's uh, Otis in this yeah. movie. And who I bet Rob Zombie fucking loves because he's dirty as shit. Well, Rob Zombie does love him. Rob Zombie has him in at least... I can think of three Rob Zombie films. Okay, right. Four that Tom Tolls is in. Okay, well, there you go. Maybe there's um, that too. He's I in, just met looking at this character. Sure. Well, you know I, that's where he came from. Right. You know, you know when Rob Zombie picks a movie... It's early in the year. I'm allowed to say Rob Zombie, right? Yeah, go ahead. When Rob Zombie picks actors, it's because of a role they did somewhere in their career. And I am willing to bet dollars to motherfucking donuts that tom tolls got picked because of otis probably the case and he's great as otis i sure. mean all the characters have to pull their weight in something where there's only three characters mm -hmm. but i don't want to talk about you know all the characters in this movie i want to talk about the serial killer sure right? that's the setup of the show and that is michael rooker yes holy crap michael rooker he's terrifying so i mean slither we talked we about talked on the about show him on slither so i'm gonna make that? you talk about him on super okay at some that's point gonna happen <laughs> somewhere i wasn't even aware that he was in super fantastic actually no you told me that yeah. before and yeah. james gunn and how have i yeah. not seen super i'm a terrible person but we'll probably skip him in mall rats you know that's weird that you mentioned mall rats because that's uh, that's probably the first film i'd ever seen him in is it i mean it's a kevin smith movie mm. It's been a while. Do we need to revisit Kevin Smith on this show? Maybe. Is that something that might need to happen? It's probably fair. We, we're all, we're we all about pick, fairness. We picked Chasing Amy on That's year true. one, mm. which I believe people bitch about 13-minute features or whatever. What uh -huh. is it? 12-minute feature? Yeah. Uh, that got about 12 seconds. Yeah. Literally about 12 seconds. But uh, Repo the Genetic Opera we talked about. Sure. And they had originally shot a short which had Michael Rooker in it and which I've never seen. Uh -huh. I'm sure it exists on one of the Repo 9000 disc box set. I'm pretty sure it's over 9000. Escape from Butcher Bay. The voice work in Escape from Butcher Bay, by the way, mm. uh, whether it's Vin Diesel or Exhibit, is all surprisingly amazing. Surprisingly amazing. 
the only reason I've ever cared about anything Vin Diesel has ever done is Butcher Bay, is uh, the Riddick stuff, and it's great. So Michael Rooker in a lot of different places, yeah, uh, popping up all over the goddamn place. But this is this is where he came from. This is his roots. This film was made on a small budget, right? Yeah, I mean we're talking. I think it's sixteen millimeter. Yeah. The budget was under you know a hundred thousand well, dollars. Okay, so I know I know that my golden apple is your wanting to talk about the background of Henry. So sure it is. Why don't you tell me how they fell into a film starring then unknown Michael Rooker? It, the story behind this movie is really amazing and something we could probably riff on for hours. Um, it's an independent film. It's got this tiny, tiny budget. Sure. One that is often described as shoestring. Also right? a tiny, tiny aspect ratio. One that is often described as uh, TV dinner. It's never described as that. But can we start that? Can Absolutely. we call these TV dinner? Done and Let's, done. Okay. We'll, right. we'll stick it on the, uh, on the glossary section of Double Feature. The okay. non-existent lexicon. Mm -hmm. Still working on it, people. Still working on it. Still yet to start it, people. <laughs> Still yet to start it. <laughs> so he was supposed to film this wrestling documentary. He'd made a, the director had made a documentary for this production company previously. And a lot of this wrestling documentary apparently... Uh, these are all details I'm vaguely recalling. So don't come to Double Feature for facts, people. I don't know what I'm talking about. A lot of the footage they were hoping to acquire for this documentary, it fell through for whatever reason. The guy wanted more money, or I don't remember what the story was. So they decided they were going to take the money used to buy out all of this film to make the documentary with, and instead give it to the director, and they basically just told him, go make a horror movie. And so only having $100,000, I mean, this isn't Robert Rodriguez. You can't just make a, a fucking Spy Kids epic for, right. you know, $7,000. $100,000, honestly, even in the hands of, you know, uh, some of the greatest filmmakers, uh, or basically any filmmaker, but Robert yeah. Rodriguez is what I'm Well, Roger to. Corman. You can, okay, yeah, I guess Roger Corman as well. Um, you have a hard time making a film, much less a great film, and this director wanted to make a great film. So I think it was through a, um, uh, episode of 2020 or one of the, the kind of investigative journalism. Those mm -hmm. words barely came out of my Prime mouth. Primetime TV, Barbara Walters. Thank you. That, uh, where they spend 40 minutes or 20 minutes or however long those shows are and kind of investigate an interesting true case. And this one was on Henry Lee Lucas. Okay. Who, when I say I, we could talk for hours about this, mm -hmm. I probably mean Henry Lee Lucas. This guy, have you ever heard of this guy before, I by the way? I haven't, and I've heard about a lot of serial killers. Yeah, so this is one of the more obscure ones. He's got a middle name, so he's got to be a serial killer. If he's gained uh, any notoriety past, you know, the initial uh, killings or confessions or what have you, it's from this movie. Sure. And probably not much beyond that. But uh, this guy was, they call him the confession killer, mm -hmm. right? He has confessed to over 600 murders. Hmm. Now, you're probably thinking, a serial killer, he's killed 600 people. He should, by all rights, no matter how boring or mundane his killings are, probably be the most talked about serial killer of all time. Well, maybe, but knowing what I know about serial killers, I'm guessing he's lying. Bingo. <laughs> Well, so it, uh, it varies from 300 to 600 when you talk about the higher end uh -huh. of ones he's confessed to and ones where they actually looked at the evidence and said, uh, that's maybe physically possible. Right. And when it comes down to it, they look through this evidence and they basically determined that uh, there's no way he could have killed this many people just given where he was. Mm -hmm. In fact, given the places he was. I think they narrowed it down to, you know, double digits, um, maybe even single digits of how many people he could have actually, you know, killed. And so this is kind of interesting. So you think, does this guy just read the paper a lot? How does he even know about 600 murders that right. he could try and take credit for? I can't remember a list of 600. I can't remember a list of 600 fucking anything, let alone names of people who appeared in a paper, you know, and where they were and details from the crime mm -hmm. or whatever. I guess what was discovered was that cops would try and empty out their entire backlog of unsolved mysteries on this guy. So as a department, you have all these unsolved cases, looks terrible for your department. Mm -hmm. You bring over the whole fucking bin of, I'm thinking of the, the seven-esque sure. 
you know, cardboard bin of case files Uh and you dump it on the desk and you just start flipping through one by one. And he basically goes, that's an interesting case because I did it. Yeah. And then you move to the next one. (laughs) Fucking stamps that shit, signs off. He's confessed. He's in prison already. Uh He's there for life or what have you. And, uh, you know, just case after case after case, the sociopath fucking uh, confesses to. Mm -hmm. And so at at the actual time that he was, uh, I think he was put on death row um, for something, I want to say it was called the Orange Sox murder or something. You're going to have to, again, if you want facts, you're going to have to look into this on your own. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to help you with this. But at the time he was really convicted and, and they, they sort of wrapped up, all right, giving him a death sentence or a life sentence or whatever, they said it was about 12, 12 people that he's probably killed, that mm-hmm. they had enough evidence to really convict him of mm-hmm. out of the 600. So this is something really, really interesting about uh, not necessarily the legal system, but how crime is done. Yeah. Um, how people are convicted. And, you know, I've, I've been spending a lot of time just through film noir stuff recently, kind of learning more about the police hierarchy and that whole system. And it just seems to appear more to more as a nine to five job yeah. as this sort of thing where you go in in the morning and you go, shit, our department has a lot of unsolved cases. The boss is really going to come down on my ass. And you empty them out in front of Henry Lee Lucas. Mm-hmm. And he totally saves you. I mean, this is, sure. it almost strikes me more as an Enron type scandal yeah. than, a, than right. something we talk about on, you know, murder uh-huh. um, nonfiction. Right. On getting to the bottom of, this isn't a, a Ted Bundy. This is a Jack Abramoff. Yeah. You know, it's a scandal. And that's, I mean, that whole system to think that cops have quotas that investigators, FBI agents, um, detectives all have quotas the mm-hmm. way anybody else probably does at their job is something that's actually a little terrifying to me. Yeah. So you you feel the quotas there. I mean, uh, certainly, I keep saying legal system. I think uh-huh. about lawyers, you know, lawyers need to win right. their cases or whatever. But when you think about the, going back to seven, when you think about the investigators, I never really thought, they're always just solving the case. They're yeah. just interested in the right. truth in my head. Right. And that's probably not always true. I mean, right. it's definitely right. not always true. That's a little terrifying to mm-hmm. me. That's thing number one that gets under my skin, and we're not even really talking about the movie yet. Well, I think, I think the other things that are really horrifying, if we're going to go back to the what makes this a horror film, mm-hmm. it's, I think the tone and the nonchalance of murder. Yes. Because like you said, there's three characters. So basically, what, 66% of your cast is okay with killing. Yeah. Also, 33% of your cast is okay with incestuous rape. Sure. Which is a grossly terrifying percentage. Mm-hmm. But if when you get to killing and then it becomes fun and then they don't want to pay for a black and white TV. Right. And the whole it time. It just seems so easy. It's just this weird mood of you kill when you don't want to do something. Right. You know, it's it's it'd be like if you or I were to go down the street into 7-Eleven grab ourselves an Arizona tea. Oh, and go, I love Arizona tea. I don't feel like paying and oh, shoot I hate the paying. cashier <laughs> right? and just walk out and go, that was easier than paying. Yeah, that is where the movie, uh, where it gets me on a mental level. I mean, I'm already feeling it physically in in how dirty it is. Right, and well, how- the low production value just makes it oh, so, so right. much better. That's exactly what I was going to say. It makes it feel more real. Yeah. It almost feels... I mean, I don't want to say it feels like a documentary. No, it doesn't. Um, it feels like it feels like a dramatization on something like 2020. Sure, sure right. And then you get the interspliced actual footage from right. when they're messing with the family and killing the son and that whole... And then, so you see this, and I'm watching it with my calloused, desensitized, I don't care about you, you kill the kid, please, I'm having yeah, fun right. mentality. And Otis goes... I'm going to watch it again. And at that point, yeah. my stomach turns. I'm like, what the fuck is Why wrong you with watch you? This again? You watch yeah. it once because they're trying to fuck with you. You don't sure. watch it again because you like it, you uh, sick bastard. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah, to think about, I mean, both of those characters, yeah. really. But uh, even Henry kind of turns a strange eye to, yeah. why would we watch this again? So there's that sense of voyeurism, too. And I'm finding quickly in films that when you want to be creepy, you take a premise that's already creepy, and once you feel like you have it refined and this is your best work and you've you've got the equation perfect, mm-hmm. you just sprinkle in voyeurism, yeah. and it always gets that much worse. Always gets that much worse. 
And you know, that, that scene that they're watching is effectively a long take yeah. too. It's uh, this impressive orchestration of these events that they have to film in a single take because that's how, you know, Henry and Otis mm-hmm. really would have filmed this thing. And so there's that, that director's point of view from that too. We should watch that again. That's a, a that's a great long take. Yeah. I think if my TV looks shitty and um and turn that uh, that wonderful pale blue. I mean, I'm actually looking for a TV like that. If anyone listening yeah. has that television, I have this kind of aesthetic. I'd almost call it a fetish. Uh-huh. It's this obsession over shitty pale blue. Right. Uh, I always think of Videodrome, even though that's probably yeah, it's not, not true. What Videodrome looks like um, just that Betamax crappy TV mm-hmm. scrolling lines. Sta- sure. God, I don't know why I love that aesthetic so much, but I absolutely adore it. So I would probably not kick in uh, that TV. I would certainly not identify with basically anything in this movie. You know, we, it's weird to talk about their mentality and it seems so foreign to me, but it's a thing that actually exists. It's the, uh, you know, he says it in the movie, open your eyes. It's either you or them. Uh huh. It's, uh, I mean, I hear that and I just think, really? Yeah. I, you know, if, if I were to describe humanism as anything, it's that I am on team human. Yep. And that's like, that's it, right? Mm-hmm. I think I have to give Rebecca Watson uh, a credit. I was re- reading about her, and uh, I guess she kind of identifies as, as humanist as well, talking about team human. That's it. Yeah. That is, we are in this fucking thing yep. together, destroy all tribalism. Right. I don't care, you know, what side of the planet people are sure. on or what they... You know, I do have this strangely American concern to protect the homeland first right. because it's what's closest to me yeah. and I do fear for myself. But I, man, I see another person suffering and yeah. they could be on another fucking planet. It's not even Team Earth. And the other thing that's terrifying to me is when I find somebody who has just this really dark outlook, people who think people are intrinsically evil. I right? believe it's called cynicism. I feel like when people, when people think that deep down people are bad people are selfish people are evil that scares me because i'm thinking that they're also on my team right you know team human right but these people that think that their teammates are bad people right it'd be like i mean that's scary to to think that there are that there might be some those are poor teammates yeah well that's the problem is i want everybody on my team to want the team to win not to want half the team to win not to want to select few teammates to succeed yeah. That's not how sports works, I think. We've once again found ourselves in a metaphor we don't know anything about. That's really just the theme of the show today. Two movies that are a bit heady that deserve to be talked about by people who aren't Eric and Michael on Double Feature. So perhaps talking about humanism also reflects one of the things I love the most about this film, which is that I feel like it's made... First of all, it almost has to be... For a film this effective, it almost has to be made from a humanist perspective. Yeah. It almost has to be made from somebody who actually cares about humanity in order to, I mean, in order to find itself horror. This isn't here accidentally. Mm -hmm. This is what the movie is about. Us versus them is, uh, I mean, one of the biggest themes of this film. And Well, it ends with this Bonnie and Clyde kind of mentality, which is a very us or them poster. Well, and ultimately, probably why he kills her, right? Yeah. Us or them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he thinks about self-preservation top priority he seems to feel a little bit for her but as soon as she's useless to him i mm-hmm. mean he's never even really using her right for anything it's uh it's just kind of an amusement for him and he snaps yep and he sees that his self-preservation has to come first and while he probably could have gotten out of this without killing her mm-hmm. that is the nature of a psychopath they're that not is necessarily the portrait of a serial killer thank you sir It's, uh, logic is probably not high on the list of of things you would dedicate to these people, although that might not be true in a lot of cases, too. Another thing that makes me think, uh, yay humanism from the the directing, the creation standpoint of this movie, is the way you feel some of these kills. And for a movie called Portrait of a Serial Killer, Mm -hmm. there is not a lot of killing. No, there's really not. I mean, on-screen killing. They do the the fantastic machete opening yep. where you, uh, oh, I don't even want to spoil that, that moment, but yeah. you put a lot of nudity and violence you mm-hmm. know, early in the movie, and then everyone thinks it's got a lot of nudity and violence right. uh, throughout the movie. But uh, And I, I mean particularly to speak of violence, but I suppose there's nudity too. 
when you when you're early in this film, you're just seeing corpse after corpse after yeah. corpse. That's the opening. He's driving around. And we're just showing you lots of corpses. We get the idea he's a serial killer, but those corpses aren't there because we need to know he's a serial killer. Mm-hmm. It's in the fucking title of the movie. They're there so we feel like he's killing left and right. Yeah. And the movie eventually came out unrated because the MPAA said there is nothing you can edit out of this. It is fundamentally... I mean, that's the worst thing you can hear back. Yeah. It is fundamentally an NC-17 film. There's nothing you can do about this. And, you know, that stalls production for a long time. A, a movie that was probably created five years before it really came out a place people could right. see it. And you get the feeling there's all of these bloody murders when you don't see a lot of them. It's mostly character study. Mm-hmm. But when you see some of the violence, and I think specifically of Otis getting stabbed in the eye. Yeah. I mean, huge credit to Tom Tolles, but uh, just the pacing, the tone, and what you've seen in the movie previous to this, you fucking feel that. It reminds me of that kind of moment from uh, the the second Kill Bill, which we'll eventually get to someday. You feel that devastation. You feel that he gets stabbed in the eye, and I just think, fuck, now yeah. he has no death perception. Well, and his this reaction is, is, it's one of the first real reactions I've seen in film where he gets stabbed in the eye and he's not a badass, oh, that sucks, but right. I'm going to get revenge. His life is over. He's yeah. done. He's, yeah. he's cashing his chips, throwing in the towel. I might as well be a dead man. My eye hurts. You know, it's amazing you say that because that sounds like such hyperbole, maybe to somebody who hasn't seen it. Mm-hmm. And maybe it doesn't have this effect for everyone. But I thought the same thing. I saw that, and I thought to myself, I have never seen a person really get stabbed in the eye Uh until just now. Right. I have never seen a moment of agony in film until this moment right here. It fucking sucks for him. It is. Oh, you're right. It's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. His life is over at this point because he's been stabbed in the eye. It. uh, We might as well see him, you know, bleed out and die. Mm -hmm. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being. And he sells that. I mean, he sells it just beautifully. Yep. I guess the weird thing about the end of this film is that by the end of the movie, you have the serial killer, Mm -hmm. Michael Rooker, Henry, and he's not the worst guy. I mean, arguably he's the worst guy in the, in the grander scale. Exactly. But in the, in the scope of the film, the worst guy is the killer who rapes his, his sister, who is already a rape victim. Sure. He dies, and you kind of get this sense of closure and relief Mm -hmm. because the bad guy has fallen. The protagonist has won. And then you realize that the protagonist is going to kill the girl that was just victimized anyway, and you're basically left punched in the gut Yeah, where the film just goes, no, they're both bad guys. Just because Rapey was killed by Stabby, it doesn't mean Stabby's going to stop stabbing. And it's an excellent way to end your independent film if you want to look at uh, having a lasting impression. I mean, this film would have been definitely worthy of talking about up to this point, but the fact we have an ending like this, it really makes, it haunts you. It stays in your mind for that exact reason. So we have uh, have a website that should also stay in your mind for some reason. Uh, That's doublefeatureshow.com. You can also email us. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. If perhaps this was not your type of slashing and you prefer your, uh, your Jason Voorhees, you can find a list of all of the Killapaloozas, including the beautiful, wonderful Sleepaway Camp uh, Killapalooza, mm-hmm. on the website using this fancy new Killapalooza feature, which uh, is only going to get better and better. Go to the website, click it, it's on the right-hand side. There's so many cool things on the website, mm. I promise. Next time, we are going to get out of art house territory, and we are going to uh, watch women wrestle in mud or something. Okay. We're going to be talking about Crank and Shoot'em Up. Yeah. Now, a little bit of a dilemma here. Yeah. Well, first off, I just want to I want to point out that Crank and Shoot'em Up sounds like a really, really bad idea. It does kind of sound like a bad idea, doesn't um, it? It it's sounds like it idea. sounds kind of like a situation where we both just went, those movies work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. But I guarantee you that there's a lot more to those films than than you realized. And one Certainly. of the things that we, we there's something we need to apologize for. Yeah, here's the thing. Uh, and this is this is part of the dilemma. So these are movies, um, one of which is a, a cheap action film that I love, and the uh-huh. other which is a cheap action film that you love. Yep. And so we're going to talk about that a little. We're going to talk about the content 
when we talk about the movies, we will hold them up as the greatest films of all time, yeah. as we attempt to do with each and every fucking episode of this Except show. Except for Chasing Amy. Except for Chasing, poor Chasing Amy. I almost feel bad at this point. I don't feel bad at all. Fuck that movie. I'm glad I got my feminism out in this show. Yeah. These films are the most misogynistic. Yeah. I almost want to call them misogynistic pieces of shit for right. how Well, we're how allowed to say that this week. They, we just can't say it next week. They are cruel and awful to women. Yes. They are fine films, and we'll have lots of nice things to say yep. about them. But this is not going to be our finest hour in regard to the treatment of women on it's this true. show. And I don't even want to touch on that next week because yeah. it'll be such a downer. So yeah. I apologize in advance. We'll just do Russ Meyer later. That'll make up for all the misogyny. <laughs> I'm not even going to tackle that. Watch more fucking film. Bye.